I've only built one boat. Uh, it, it was a fairly large project for me with zero experience. Uh, so I was feeling my way and, and teaching myself as I went. Uh, my background's in mechanical engineering and uh, uh, you know, the electrical aspect, uh, I'm pretty familiar with electricity, uh, the nuances of marine electronics, electricity are, um, you know, are a little different than uh, what you might do in a laboratory or at home. And uh, so my, my main purpose in having the survey done after I built the boat was for my own education to find out what I did wrong. And uh, it turned out I did a few things wrong, uh, but none of them were that major. And the uh, secondary reason for having the survey done is if you want to insure your boat, it's going to be required, uh, I think, generally for a significant boat to have a survey uh, that, that establishes the, the, uh, the uh, parameters around the boat so they can figure out a value and uh, make sure that it's built properly. It's not going to be a... Uh, a liability for the insurance company. Obviously, insurance companies don't really like to pay out, so they're not going to insure something that's uh, sketchy. Uh, so, I did a little research on the statistics about boat fires. It's a little sobering that 74% of the fires are caused by electrical issues, which is probably, to me, no surprise, having chartered a lot of boats and looked under the under the sole and at the electrical panels, at the rat's nest of wires that uh, generally are uh, retrofits by owners who think they know what they're doing, but uh, you know, maybe you don't exactly. So there's usually a, a, a lack of fuses or proper terminations or wire size. Uh, and about 43% of those are DC related. And you would think, well, it's only 12 volts. How dangerous can that be? Uh, but you know, when you've got a, a high capacity battery behind it, and uh, an, a, you know, a, a small wire and a large fuse, you basically have a, uh, the makings of a, of a Brit toaster uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a combustible zone. So it is hazardous. And then uh, about 21% are AC related. Are what? 21% of the fires are AC electricity related. Oh. Shore power, in other words, or the inverter aspect. And then 26% are sources uh, off the boat. So the marina burns down, uh, another boat uh, nearby catches fire, etc. cetera. So uh, it's food for thought. Uh, so just to give you some background on what I call the subject boat, it's, uh, it's, called, a Z it's called a Zockendrager. It's, uh, it's a 21 foot red wing, pilot house type. Uh, they also do a smaller version that's open, but this has, because of our weather in this area, wanted something that was a little more comfortable and, and useful for year-round. So it's got AC and DC electrical. It's got two circuit board, uh, circuit breaker panels. It's got one fuse panel. So if you want to run your bilge pumps or, uh, in my case, a heater, it has to be on a 24-7 panel. It, it's, not, it's not turned off when you turn off your main power. There's not much point having a bilge pump if you don't have electricity to it when you're not on the boat. Uh, so three panels, and then it's got a battery charger. Uh, if I'm connected to shore power, which is I'm not normally unless I'm cruising, it's got one lead acid battery. It's got an outboard motor, just 20 horsepower with an alternator. Uh, it's got uh, inter interior and navigation lights, VHF uh, radio. It's got a few instruments, has a windshield wiper, uh, two automatic bilge pumps, a shore power connector, and it's got a centered bronze ground plate. And uh, there's always a certain amount of debate amongst people as to whether you need to gr have a ground on your boat. Uh, you definitely need to have a ground if you have an AC system. It's a safety ground. It's, uh, it's the way you prevent somebody from getting killed if something goes wrong, just like the ground wire in a, in, in a house. But on a boat, you have to ground it somewhere. And uh, since I didn't want to ground it, I didn't have an inboard, which is often how you ground them. I, it's recommended to install a small bronze plate in the, in the bottom of the hull. I have a 12 gallon uh, gasoline fuel tank. It's a high density polyethylene. And polyethylene tanks uh, have different uh, ventilation requirements from aluminum tanks or metal tanks. So I, I kind of made life more complicated for myself by using a plastic tank. 
uh, which because I had plastic breeze, and you, if you stick your nose down in the bilge, you'll smell the fumes, of, and so you have it has to be ventilated. If, if you have an aluminum tank, you don't have that problem; it doesn't have to be ventilated. But then, if you're in salt water and you get salt water on the tank, then you have to worry about corrosion. So, kind of you know, take your pick your poison. Uh, it's got a that, that was the tanks are installed below the the, the, the cockpit sole. I've got a non-pressurized alcohol stove. From experience, I would never recommend a pressurized alcohol stove. I've seen fires from those, pictures of burned uh, to the waterline boats. So if you want to use alcohol, use a, a Rego non-pressurized. And then it's got a kerosene furnace, uh, it's 1300 watt. It's uh, very much like a, a home furnace. It's got two blowers, but it's a, a little, it's like this, a little bigger than a toaster. It's just a really amazing gadget, but it does require a kerosene uh, fuel tank and uh, you know, another potential for uh, for fire. It weighs about 2,750 pounds, so there's quite a bit there. And I use the U.S. Coast Guard booklet uh, called Safety Standards for Backyard Builders. If you <coughs> if you're building a boat in your backyard, it might be something worth looking to looking at. I found it very generally not very useful. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great on, uh, on figuring out the capacity of your boat, how many people, uh, the stability of your boat. Uh, but as far as fuel and electrical, I think there were two pages out of 50. Uh, very general. So, and then the other option was to buy uh, uh, the ABYC uh, standards, which are what the uh, what U.S. builders use. Only product. The problem with that was you know, they're not available for free online, like some standards, and they cost a ton of money. Like, I don't know, it was more than 500, maybe 700. It was a lot of money. It was like, no, I'm not buying that. So <clears throat> there, is, there are British standards online. I figure the British have been building boats a long time. They probably, <laughs> they probably know something about building boats. So I, I downloaded all the sections, and they have sections on every aspect of your boat. So, uh, you know, if you need a little more information, uh, I'd say, you know, just start with the British standards. Hey, Ralph. Hey. Um, there's one There's one specific book that for mechanical and electrical systems. Um, it's almost, as it's, the, the guy who wrote it is a member Calder, of the ABC. Or, uh, not Calder, but Nigel Calder. Nigel, yeah. Mechanical and electrical. Yeah. <coughs> it, it's like, you just have to have that. Right. Have yeah, we have the library. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Uh, I, that was one of my Bibles, and I, I found a couple others. He's quite good. Gets pretty dense, but if you dig through it and think about it and read it two or three times, some set, some, the more confusing sections, eventually you'll figure out what to do. The grounding was kind of one of the more the difficult parts, but yeah, it's a, it's a really good book to refer to. And it, like I say, it's free in the library. Uh, you can get them secondhand at PALS or whatever. So yeah, there's a, there, are, there are two other two or three others that are cover some of the other areas, but maybe not as well as called. Uh, do we have one in the, in the library? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I've seen it. Yeah. Right, Bruce? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw it. Okay, so yeah, so I, I wanted to see what mistakes I made, and so who did I hire? I, I dug around, uh, asked a few people I knew, you know, who's a, who's a good surveyor in Portland, and the name of Allison Maison came up. And, uh, in our own neighborhood. Yeah, yeah um, and she was really good, I thought. Um, She's not, I would say she's probably a non-commercial surveyor. She did, tends to do you know, smaller boats. Uh, I mean, smaller, like probably 50 foot or, or so uh, and under. But the, the survey cost at that time, 2010, about $340. So I guess you'd say it wasn't cheap, but it was, I thought oh, I got a lot of good information. And what, so what did I find out? Oh, and this, let me just show you. Uh, so here's. Here's a copy of, uh, of uh, what I got. She takes some photos, she documents a couple pages. You know, if you ever look online and you're dreaming and you want to buy a boat, and you, so you have the, they have the survey posted and you can read through it. It's kind of, it's kind of like this, but uh, and then, so she kind of covers all, all the systems, everything she goes through, it, every, whatever, documents everything. And then she has immediate attention required. That's, that's the stuff that gets your attention. This is the stuff you have to fix if you want a safe boat and you want to get insured. And then she goes to the timely, timely attention required. 
So that's like a pretty good idea to do these, but they're not like showstoppers. And then finally, maintenance items. So these are like the niggly stuff that, uh, you know, when you have time, she recommends you do them. And then she takes some more photos <laughs> and uh, yeah. So uh, I'll leave, I don't want to pass it out now because you'll be distracted. So, but if you want to look at it afterwards, I'll leave it there for a while. All right, so what I found out, the eight immediate attention required items. Number one, the fuel tank vent hose had some traps or low spots. So in other words, uh, you know, your tank has a fill and a vent and you want it to be like continuously rising. You don't want to have any low spots because that could trap fuel and that is like a, it's like a trap in your sink and that could cause a little bit of pressure build up. So when you're filling your tank, you might get it to burp out the filler instead of out the vent. So that was an easy one. I just had to reroute the hose a little bit. Number two, no anti-siphon valve. So on the outlet of your fuel tank, there's a valve. It's kind of like a, ch like a reverse check valve. So it's got a little ball in it, the spring. And when you pull fuel out, you need a little bit of suction in order to get the fuel out. And the idea of this is if you start the fuel flowing and then you create a siphon by taking your outlet hose and putting it below your tank, the, you don't want the fuel to keep on going. So they put this anti-siphon valve in which breaks the siphon. So when you, when you squeeze, if you use an outboard, when you squeeze the bulb, it has enough suction to overcome the, the pressure of this anti-siphon valve. If you, if you do some research on it, some people say, oh, those things are pain, they cause me problems, I took it out. I haven't had any problems. So, uh, and why I didn't put one in, I knew, I, need, I knew it was generally required, but I kind of looked at the situation and I said, nah, I can't ever have a siphon with my setup. I'm not gonna put it in. But, you know, I started thinking, well, okay, if you had this really weird situation where the hose, you know, this, this uh, expensive hose somehow broke and somehow fell below the level of the tank and somehow I, you know, had fuel flowing or, you know, this or that, Maybe, you know, so, all right, so I installed them. Uh, this was kind of a, a, a wake up call. So I used an inline, this is number three, I used an inline plastic fuel filter. Uh, so, you know, you can get these small inline filters. Often, they, if, if you're diligent, you put, you'll install one in your uh, outboard motor hose between your tank and your engine. And that'll trap the, the stuff before it gets to the outboard motor t uh, filter. Well, so I'd seen that done, and when I initially started using the boat, I was not using the internal tank, I was using a portable. So I just installed one of those, and then when I connect, uh, so if I wanted to, thought if I was going on a longer trip, I, I'll disconnect the quick disconnect from the tank, and I'll connect it to my built-in tank, the 12-gallon tank, instead of my three-gallon tank. I thought, you know, I've got it covered. Well, it turns out once you put that filter inside an enclosed space, it's no longer legal. So, uh, it had to be removed. So, I, what I need to do is get a uh, like a Raycor bulkhead mounted spin on water fuel uh, separator filter with a bowl and uh, install that in the engine compartment. <laughs> and that solved that problem. Now, the, another problem that came out of that was that when I bought the filter, the Raycor, it had a plastic. Uh, uh, bowl under the filter so you could drain it. It's got a little drain valve. You can put a hose on that. You can check for water in your in your bowl. I thought this is a good thing. Well, it turns out it's illegal. <laughs> so you have to buy the aluminum one that you obviously can't see through and has to have a plug. Uh, I suppose a valve with a cap would be okay, but I just use a plug. And the reason it's not legal is it can, if there's a fire in your engine compartment, which in my case was an enclosed, enclosed well, this plastic burns and now you have a, a you know, further uh, source of ignition. You get all the fuel draining out of the uh, filter. So just keep in mind, if you ever install one of these in an engine compartment, it's not legal. So it's so, only if it's in a, in an engine compartment. Other if it's if it's outside of an engine compartment. If it's outside of an engine compartment. It's okay, yeah. but if it's in the engine compartment, it's not legal. Yeah. So okay, so you got that now. Uh, 
So the next thing was I was I was using you know when you get an outboard motor uh, fuel line, you, you've got the two connectors and the bulb and it's kind of a you know a small outboard. It's sort of a small hose. You would think that would be legal for all marine use. Well, turns out it's not. So I had I had I had that line going from my. Uh, built-in tank out to the engine uh, on my sort of temporary setup and she said no if it's in an enclosed space it has to be US Coast Guard type A1 hose so uh, this is this is what the hose looks like and it's it, if you haven't seen it before it's actually marked it's low permeation so that means you won't get a lot of vapor in your enclosed space through the wall and it's stamped type A1, and that's the only thing legal. So uh, it looks kind of like almost any other fuel hose, but it's better and costs more. It's better than all the hose. Yeah. Depending on where you buy it, I, I've, you know, I think West Marine it was like, I don't know, ridiculous, like six dollars a foot or something, and I think that. I think at Sexton's it was like two dollars a foot. I mean, so you know, shop around. Yeah, that's Sexton's. No, no. Uh, Another Sexton's one? is on Hayden is on uh, Hayden Island. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jansen Beach. Huh? Jansen Beach. Yeah. Yeah. Jansen. Well, not on Jansen Beach. It's, it's on uh, close to actually fairly close to a subway. Okay. But on hmm. Marine Drive. Okay. Yeah, so I, like they, I say, they do uh, a lot of work on the aluminum inboards and the okay. offshore boats. Yeah, I mean, I, I, they have a parts store too. As I said, initially, you know, I was a babe in the woods. I had zero experience. I had to do a lot of research. I, got, I tried to, you know, I got probably got most of the stuff right, not everything, and. I learned that you have to shop around for everything. I, I probably bought stuff from 10 different places around the country, including secondhand. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, there's no fair, fair, fair trade prices uh, for marine stuff. Okay, number five, I, I had a quick disconnect. So on the end of my outboard motor hose, I had a quick disconnect, which connected to my tank, uh, my built-in tank. And that was originally because I wanted the option to be able to either use a portable tank or, well, it turns out it's, if it's permanent, then it's going to be permanent. So I had to replace the quick disconnect with a, with a pipe thread to barb fitting and, uh, and put a hose clamp on it. So that's kind of the end. Of, so that's, that's all my fuel stuff. You know, fairly minor stuff. It took me a pretty short time to fix all that. So then the next thing was electrical. I had, so coming out of the battery, I had a, a large wire that went from the battery to the engine, and that was for starting the engine and for bringing the current from the alternator back into the battery. And then there's some small wires that went to my electrical panel. So I had a fuse on the small wires, but I did not have a fuse on the big wire. Well, you think about it, like really should have been a fuse there. And there's no fuse inside the outboard motor. They, they, don't, there's, they don't give you that. So. Uh, so I was looking around for hardware, like how am I going to do this easily? It turns out there's this really slick little gadget made by uh, Blue Sea Marine, or at least they handle it. It's actually made by Eaton. You, it, it bolts, it, it uh, goes through a stud on your battery with a, you put a nut, nut on it, and then it's got <laughs> these um, fuses that uh, s slip over the stud, and this was a, this is a 75 amp. But you can get it, they can get them, in, I think, from 10 amps up, and you just put that on, and then you connect. And then I connected my big wire from my uh, the heavy wire from my outboard onto this, and now I was legal. So uh, easy way to fix a problem like that and, and be safe. Uh, yeah, and you're, you're supposed to have a, a either you're supposed to have a fuse within seven inches of the source of power. So let's keep in mind seven inches. That's that's what's required by Coast Guard. So ARDC does, not require, ARDC does not require a fuse between the battery and the motor, but they strongly recommend it. Okay. But it's not a requirement. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting I'm putting breakers in. Okay. And they're two and a half times my max current. 
Just because I think it's stupid not to have it. Yeah. yeah in my case, the the bra all my breakers and fuses are in the co in the controls, which is about uh, twelve feet or so from my battery. Battery's back by the engine. So uh, you know, and you've got all that wire, and you really don't want to have. I have fuse. I have a, a main fuse. Uh, before I got to go into my circuit breaker panel on the DC, but I didn't have, you know, I, I knew what, if I wanted to comply with the recommendation, then I should have a fuse next to the battery as well. But also, this was after the survey, I added a solar panel to maintain my battery. It's only five watts, but you, again, you, you, need a, you need a fuse, and that's where it connects to your battery as well. So I just put one of those inline fuses, uh, waterproof type. It's interesting that they specify distance yeah. from the battery because, I mean, really all you need is a fuse anywhere in the line. Well, if it, it should be, you no. Know, if you want to protect against the possibility of a, of a fire, you want to be as close as you can to the source. Because if you put the fuse at the end and, well, and, and there's a break, a short somewhere between the fuse and the, and the source, all that wire is going to carry the, the maximum current. So the, worst, the worst case scenario is that that, that big wire um, falls out of its um, crimp terminal and lands in the village or lands on something that conducts electricity like the engine block, um, then, it, then it's shorted. That's why the, the seven inch requirement. Yeah. Which is not, um, it also says if practicable. Yeah. Which means that I've got like a foot and a half because I just couldn't find any way to practically do that uh, without um, the other thing that. Um, discover if you go to a big boat, every single device you buy says connect this directly to the battery. <laughs> <laughs> so what you would wind up with is, you know, 20 wires going directly to the positive terminal with fuses within that, that distance. It's totally impractical and, and practicality does rule. Yeah, you know, in that case if you do a lot of stuff, you know, you use a terminal, a, ter a terminal strip near your battery and but you, then each one wants to have its own fuse size according to the wire size or the load for the, the draw. All right, so number seven, uh, I didn't have a, a CO or smoke detector. And the, the CO detector is required after 2003. So I was clearly in violation. And smoke detect, detectors are recommended for boats 26 feet and longer. Uh, as well, so I just bought a combination CO smoke detector and uh, installed it. And then uh, I had two fire extinguishers on board and one of them was, I think, in a drawer and that was a no-no. They have to be mounted and for my size boat, she said you should have three fire extinguishers. So I have three and um, two of them are BCs and one's an ABC. So if you know your ABCs, the, the C is for electrical, energized electrical, and the A, B is for, you know, wood, paper, cloth, and uh, um, uh, um, flammable, combustible liquids. So uh, don't use your A, B on electrical fire. All right, so that was, those are the eight things. Then there were the three timelies. One was I had no boarding, no reboarding ladder. So... Um, you know, probably not required, but I guess, you know, maybe have a hard time getting back on the boat. So I just bought one of those folding folding ladders. I'm, I'm probably more concerned about, my, you know, if I was there out there with my wife, I'm not sure she could haul me on board. So uh, hopefully she wouldn't just go off and leave me. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. Do you have good insurance policy? <laughs> Yeah, pretty good. So anyway, it's just a, it's a it's a it's a folding type, and it's uh, it just slip it would slip over a cleat, and I think I could get back on board with that. And then I didn't have labels on a couple of the circuit uh, a couple of the circuit breakers. So the bilge pump and the nav light switches were not not uh, present, so I added those. And then this one was kind of interesting because the uh, the cockpit only I only installed a one inch drain into the cockpit. Uh, there were also seat, two seat drains, but it would get pretty high. And, and she said, if, you, if, you're, if you're up in the Puget Sound and you, got, you took a wave over the, over the side, that's too small a drain. 
So I subsequently added another inch and a half drain. Uh, each one has its own through hole uh, valve. Uh, yeah. So uh, that took care of the timely recommended. And I, I won't go through the, uh, the maintenance items. Uh, they're a little of lesser importance, but in good information. So that was kind of what I got out of the survey. And uh, the other thing I found is that when you're doing a survey, it can be, if you particularly in a home bill, it's kind of hard to establish what the value is. So if you want to insure it for a total loss, how do you establish the value? I mean, you've got your material, but you know, how do you value your labor? Can you value your labor? You know, would you, and um, so you might do comparable. So this boat was kind of like a sea dory, but it could also be kind of like a Devlin boat, you know, at the other extreme. So, you know, the value could be replacement. I mean, your, the replacement value could be from here to there. And um, ultimately you kind of decide how comfortable you feel with uh, insuring it for some amount, and you, and if the insurance company will accept that, then I guess that's what you insure it for. Uh, so, but I think the insured value, you know, I'd probably go for about twice what the material cost was if I could if yeah. I could do yeah. it. Yeah. <clears throat> I was, I, you know, on uh, Mojo, I was able to negotiate with the insurance yeah. company because they came back. With U.S. boat and on the whole bill, they only insured it for what the material was. Okay. And then so the, the hull of the motor, all that, is one price, and then I have another for the trailer. Okay. And so <laughs> I don't, so if I lose the trailer, somebody steals it, I'll get to replace right. the trailer because that was a fixed price. So I'm, I just told them up what I spent on it, and they said, okay, that's fine. Who did you, who did you, who did you uh, insure it with? Or get U.S. boat. U.S. boat, okay. which is Geico. Yeah. So I, I'll, all right. So I'll start talking about insurance now. You know, again, not an expert, but in my experience, um, yeah. So getting an insurance quote, uh, Geico your, is is one of the big insurers, and actually it turns out State Farm is a big insurer. I, I never would have suspected, but that's who I happen to have my all my other insurance with. So they said, yeah, we, we insure a lot of boats. So. Uh, Right, so just to get to the bottom line, the current cost is 160 bucks a year, which is pretty cheap for liability and hull. And what it insures is um, about 35K of hull value, including the motor and equipment. And uh, emergency service, nominal, it's a thousand bucks, but that actually would include towing if you, uh, or and a few other things uh, that U.S. boat tries to sell you separately. Uh, wreck removal, so if you if it's sunk, they'll, you know, somebody will haul it out. The big items are the liability, watercraft liability, for half a million bucks. So that that pretty much covers all the damage you can do. Uh, anyone driving your boat can do if you, with your permit. If they have your permission, if someone's injured on your boat uh, and sues you, uh, any you know it's. You know, every, so it's pretty broad, legal defense, all that. And then uh, a very small amount on, on uh, basically emergency room visit for medical, about $5,000 per person, which would be pretty minor. But so if it's more than that, it'll go into the liability. And you get a, you get a credit of 20 bucks for uh, having taken the safety course. Uh, but the one thing I really, so, what, oh, so that's just, that's what I have. There are other things you can get, personal effects coverage for any belongings that are on board, uh, uninsured boater. So after, you know, after 12 years of experience on the water, I was starting to think, you know, I ought to look into uninsured boater. Because <laughs> you don't have to have insurance to have a boat out there. There's all these people zipping around, and, you know, who knows whether uh, they're insured. It turns out it only costs an extra 45 bucks a year to have uh, uninsured uh, voter coverage. 
That would, you know, so I, I'm thinking I'll probably get that. And then the boat trailer insurance, as you mentioned, is also an extra. I don't have a, I don't have a trailer, so I don't need that. Uh, so they, they give you a questionnaire before they uh, give you a quote. So they want to know where the boat's being kept. Are you living aboard it? Was there an inspection and survey? And send them a copy. So that's the, the second reason to have a survey. Uh, the use of your boat. Basically, they want to know whether you're hiring it out or not, and where are you going to be boating. The type of boat. Who is the, who is the designer? The size, the motor horsepower, the, the, the hull material. They want the hull number. Of course, at the time I'm getting insurance, I don't have the hull number, so that, that comes, you have to give them that later. We'll talk about the hull number. And uh, have you? What kind of experience do you have? Have you had a history of any violations or accidents? Claims, the value of the boat, and how much you want to insure it for. So it's probably very. It's somewhat like getting a car insurance, right? Yeah. I think one one thing you know you will almost always see uh, if you if you have a survey, they require a survey. You'll get an offer to underwrite, which is a letter they send you that will issue a policy when this, this, this yeah. and this are corrected. Yep. Um, now, if you really want insurance on the cheap or on the fly, it's not actually cheap. Uh, I insured my boat, my current boat, with Progressive, and while I did have a survey, they didn't want to see it. Yeah. Um, they wrote a policy over the phone. They, it's through USAA, so I don't know if they do that for everybody or just for USAA customers, but literally, uh, my wife, 10 minutes on the phone, and we had your insurance policy. Yeah. It might be a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea what that boat is really like. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll see what happens when you try to collect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I thought the, I thought State Farm's process was pretty thorough. I felt pretty comfortable, and uh, I've been working with these people for 20 years before that. So anyway, no claims so far. So I guess that the price actually went down uh, this past year. I was a little surprised. That's how often does the price go down? But I guess either. Uh, <clears throat> based on age or, or no claims, I don't know. Uh, so, okay, so the last section is how to register a boat, assuming it's home built, which probably pertains to quite a few of us. Uh, so the first thing is you find the nearby Oregon boating agents. These are typically boat retailers, the people that we never deal with. Uh, and I just went to the one that was nearest to where I lived. And you get two forms, the Home Built Boat Builder Certificate, and, the, and that has to be notarized, and the, the Marine Board Application for Boat Title and Registration. So, the Marine Board has this nice little booklet on, I just bought a boat, now what? So it kind of walks you through a lot of stuff. This is the card you get once you register. A lot of you may already have one of those. It's just, it's just like a miniature version of your car registration, but keep it on your boat. Uh, this was a list of all the agents. Uh, so uh, they're, they're all over the state. I, there's, there was one in Selwood, one in Jansen Beach, uh, Swan Island Marine. You don't need to use them. I, well, back then I think you did, but maybe now you can do it all online. When, when did you? 2010. Uh, I did Fish Taco in 2016, yeah. just through the mail. Right. And, and what agency do you register the boat with? Well, it's, it's the Marine Board. It's the Marine Board. Yeah, yeah. Marine Board. Ultimately. So, yeah, <laughs> right. So things may have changed. I figured you could probably do more of it online. So the one, the one, the first form is the home built uh, boat builder certificate. It's pretty straightforward. It's basically one page. <coughs> the back is uh, to tell you how much you owe them, and the front page is uh, describes the boat, where the materials came from, and your signature and the notary. System. So, and then the second one is the application for title. It's the usual stuff: your name, address, uh, how much you owe them. And what it's made out of. You send that in, and uh, uh, I think this was the form that the uh, the boat uh, the the retail agency gave me 
that the, got sent along. And so you send that, and then you, uh, not too long after that, you'll get something from the Marine Board, which is kind of what you're looking for, uh, a temporary registration. And I think if you do it online and you print it out yourself, I, I, I've kind of done that uh, more recently. Uh, and then at that point, you need to arrange with a Marine Board officer to inspect your boat. And you either take it there on your trailer or you arrange for them to come visit where your boat is moored, which is what I had in my case. They came and visited. They basically want to verify that what you applied for is what they're seeing physically. And once they do that, they, uh, this was the temporary registration that I got in the mail. And then they fill out this uh, form here and give you a copy. It says uh, who inspected, what they saw, and that gets sent in. And once the Marine Board gets that, they send you a, another form with the uh, uh, whole number okay and once you have a whole number you find some place to get whole number tags made I went to a like a trophy store had them make me up a couple with an, and, I, and I got some screws that are kind of the hard to take out screws you need theoretically a special tool you install one on the starboard side of the transom and another one somewhere they say hidden uh, and I installed it inside the cabin. Three? I did three off this top. Okay. So, your boat, the two hidden ones, right. one really hidden. Yeah. The other one, you can find it as you can reach up underneath the foredeck and find it. Yeah. But I put another one in just because I figured they'd find those two and look for the third. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and yeah. I bought the bronze rod with the Harbor Freight dies. I just stamped again. Okay, yeah. I'm probably to get it right. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm noticing one of my tags is, <clears throat> is it were, they're a plastic, the outside one, and the sun affects it, so I may end up making a new one up. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, at least two, and then uh, you put, then you get, you get your registration numbers and uh, the year sticker, you put that on and you renew every two years. So that's kind of, but the Marine Board uh, website's pretty good. I would, I'd say go there first and probably figure it out from there. So the last question is what boats need to be registered? So you must title and register your boat if it has any kind of motor, any type of motor. So electric, gas, diesel, <coughs> steam, whatever. It's got a, it's got a motor, it's gotta be registered. Uh, and, if it's a, and if it doesn't have a motor, but it's a sailboat, and it's at least 12 feet or more, then it has to be registered, okay? Yeah. 12 feet more. Yeah. Exceptions, if it's not motorized, and, um, or if it's registered in another state and it spends less than 60 days in Oregon. So obviously you have to register in the other state, but not in Oregon. However, <laughs> I didn't know this, and uh, it probably maybe a lot of you do. I was talking to Russ, he knew about it. If it's non motorized, 10 feet and longer, you have to have a waterway access permit. $7 a week or 17 bucks a year. You get it from the Oregon Fish and Wildlife, and if you don't have it and they stop you, it's a $115 fine. Okay. Is this in addition to registration in another state? What, say it again? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Water yeah. Water is, that, is, that, is that what they're I'm calling the, is that what they used yeah. to call the invasive species uh, permit? Exactly. Yeah. Is it's, it? it's to control invasive species. Okay. That's what that's yeah, all. Uh, What's the length on that now? That's 10, 10 feet. feet. 10, and 10, 10 feet and longer. Is it, isn't that like just to count the fishing license for all you have to do is yeah. have one on your possession? That it can transfer from boat to boat? Uh, yeah, I think that might be true. The seventeen dollar one does. Yeah. yeah. But it comes with the boat that's registered. So if your boat's registered, yeah. you have to show them you're registered. Right. Right. 
So but if you, have a, if you have a kayak, yeah, you know, carry a 15 foot kayak, you have to carry one along with you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You'll see a lot of people don't register the boat to the Olympic boats because they feel they're covered and they don't need to. Well, in Washington, it's not required. Okay. If you, now, if, you, if you're on navigable waters of the U.S., so like any salt water anywhere, anything that gets to the ocean, basically, uh, then anything with a motor of any kind has to be registered. But if you're only on lakes and streams in Washington that are non-navigable, and you have, I think it's less than 10 horsepower, um, you, you, it's not required to be registered. Uh, that's why they came out with a 9-9 motor. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I have. Uh, any easy questions? I'll try to answer. Well, there's no, there's one, 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 one <laughs> magic word for um, surveys. I, I, Allison is absolutely the best surveyor I have ever encountered, and I've paid for about a dozen surveys at least. Yeah. Um, I paid for one in San Diego, which cost me two hundred and seventy-five dollars. I said the magic words: insurance survey. And that man did not stop walking while he was on board. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he, he looked at the boat, he said, yeah, it seems to be pretty sound. But that was, um, you know, compared to a $700 or $800 survey for, for a 36-foot sailboat uh, from Allison, um, I was just changing insurance companies, and, and it was, you know, but he knew it was an insurance survey. If it had been a pre-purchase survey, I would have been very disappointed in that, <laughs> in the quality of work. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an interesting point that when you see, someone says, I, I, I was reading the boat, I'm, I, I want to buy this boat, it was recently surveyed, it's like, yeah, this probably wasn't the survey you want no. if you're going to buy it because yeah, it's right. not going to be thorough enough. It's just, yeah. so yeah, you get. Yeah, when I bought my Grand Banks, uh, Sam Burko said, no, no, we don't want Allison, we don't want Allison. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the guy didn't find so many things, so I ended up selling it a year later because there was so many things wrong with it yeah, that he missed. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if I had her, she would have found them. I would have not have bought that Grand Banks. I would have bought the more expensive one. Right. And I would have been happy to pay to her, I can't remember, it was like $1,500, $1,200. I would have been happy to pay it not to buy that boat. Right. It would have saved me money. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, Rep. Well, the only question I have is, can I get a can I get a copy of your notes? Yeah. <laughs> if, you're, if you're selling a boat, you don't want Alex. If you're buying a boat, you don't. Yes. <laughs>